Assalamu alaikum. Welcome to episode 8 of the Believers Early Christ podcast. Now, have you ever been interested in a career that combines a bit of psychology, sociology, and government politics? I can imagine, well, almost every sort of person in the young Muslim community probably has been interested in that or probably has one of those things as one of the subjects at A-level or some sort of interest, you know, in these areas. But do you know what career in social research is like? Because in this episode, this is what we're going to cover. So this episode is going to be focused on the social research fast stream. And it's going to be with Semiha Begum. And some of you may notice that she's actually on the fast stream website as the social research ambassador. So again, like the other sort of episodes, we cover why she, she went for the social research stream, what led to it, what it's actually like, her advice for those considering it, and a lot more, basically. It's um, interesting because she, when you listen to her, you probably think she's pretty much made or been born to like be a civil servant in this career from a pretty much a young age. But I think there's a lot you can take from in terms of what her passions and interests were and what led her to it and how you can learn from that and take from it as well. And, you know, she was also contactable by LinkedIn if you need some follow-up advice or any questions you want answered. Um, also to add, every now and then, when you're doing a podcast or when you're doing anything, you do get glitches. And in this episode, we had a video glitch, so it's going to be audio only. So if you are listening to this, sorry, if you're watching this on YouTube, then perhaps you might want to listen to this on any podcast app, like is it Apple Podcasts, iTunes, Google Podcasts, Podbean, Spotify, any of those really, um, you can listen to it. I um, just wanted to give you that information. But if you listen to this, then you can continue as normal and enjoy the episode. And yeah, if there's any feedback, advice, or if you find this helpful, let us know because... You know, that'd be that'd be good to know because I I I, I want to know if this if this content is, you know, helpful and giving you real insight into different careers, or if there's things that I'm missing that perhaps I'm not asking in the podcast or that I'm not including. So yeah, feel free to comment and engage. Aside from that, enjoy the episode. Mm. Samiha, welcome to the Believers Early Credits podcast. And really sorry for that little technical glitch and, and delay. Sometimes it just happens, but we finally, it seems to be in order and seems to be working. So alhamdulillah, um, welcome and, you know, looking forward to hearing your sort of journey on the fast stream social research, the social research stream. Is that right? Yeah, yeah that's correct. And that, not a problem at all. Cool. Um, so I think we're going to begin with the, so currently the, the last few episodes or the ones we've kind of be, begun with has focused a bit on fast stream. So we've done one on the DDAT scheme with uh, Manchur Ahmed and we've done one recently with somebody that just got into the project delivery scheme. So we focused particularly on the fast stream assessment center. But I think in this case, we're going to slowly focus on an area of work that I don't think people really consider or think about, especially young Muslims that for me when I grew up things like social research like didn't really come on my radar I didn't really understand what that sort of actually meant and you know what a career in that would look like because it sounds really interesting it sounds like mm -hmm. it ties in a lot with you know subjects that people are generally interested in like sociology psychology and all of that but it'd be good to you know as we always start off with is a sort of career story so from college to how you got into the far stream how did that journey begin and how did it lead you onto the fast stream? Yeah, um, so I'd say I was always interested in social issues. I grew up during the the recession and around that time as well, I'd just been to Bangladesh and I was about 11 or 12 and you'd be at that point quite sensitive to some areas where there was a lot of abject poverty and things like that. I think then returning from Bangladesh for the summer to then the UK where 
the conversation was all about austerity or the dark times ahead definitely I would think a lot about the people who are very vulnerable in society and whether they'd still be sort of uh, considered and taken care of those, those sorts of things so I had that interest all throughout secondary school watch the news check anything I didn't understand against my teachers and then just build up that interest initially actually thinking that I'd go into politics um but and the 2010 election happened after the results uh came in I emailed my MP at the time who was Sadiq Khan and I just was <laughs> like just complaining I think I wasn't very happy with what was happening in the country and I just was like a very enthusiastic teenager I think um and he invited me to do some work experience with him in Westminster it was really cool I got to go to the House of Commons, I got to shadow him, I got to work with his advisors. Um, but it made me realise that actually politics wasn't how I wanted to contribute. Not that I mean I could, <laughs> but politics was how I wanted to, wasn't how I wanted to contribute to, or it wasn't how I thought I could make my contribution to like so, social change and making society a bit more positive. And, what was it um, about it that kind of put you off out of curiosity? It was, well... It's a lot of bureaucracy, isn't it? Well, I, yeah and well, I caveated by saying I was there for two weeks so I I wasn't I definitely didn't have a, a full picture and I was 15 <laughs> but I think it was just more the the bureaucracy that it wasn't I wasn't as close to the policy as I as I wanted to be I wasn't as po- close to the decisions that were being made and obviously I wouldn't be at that age anyway I was doing a lot I was helping with the speech writing and there's a place for that and it's so important to connect with the community and that's exactly what I want to do but it just wasn't the right the right way in I think I, I think I just there was so much like drama at the time politically it was during the news of the world scandal 2011 and it was really that there was a spectacle but it wasn't what I was interested in I think I wanted to move away from like all the parties and the conflicts and debates and just focus on pol- at the time I didn't know it was policy that I wanted to focus on but I, I knew that it wasn't politics if that makes sense yeah I think it sounds like you wanted to get more involved in the heart of the issue and resolving it rather than the sort of bureaucracy and uh, the, all, the, all, the, all the little stuff that goes on behind the scenes that people don't really know about, like drafting the papers, dealing with this, dealing with that, then having to deal with like ministerial briefings. And I think, yeah, it sounds like you wanted to more focus directly on the issue at hand and try to make a change there, which I think when you're at that, especially at that younger age and, and you don't know like the, the way it really works inside parliament and all of that then I think you really have that that view that you know you want to go in and make a change but and why can't this be done why isn't it just as straightforward as you know there's the issue this is what we need to do to resolve it but I think once you you're in that environment those two weeks perhaps showed you that it's, it's very um different and a bit sort of long-winded and yeah there's, there's a lot of um challenges and bureaucracy around it which can yeah can be off point and I sometimes think I'm not sure if you share this um view but I think sometimes we can especially with that the politics stuff, you can get really caught up in all the noise and all the drama. And sometimes you might feel a bit, well, sometimes when I, when I used to like really kind of be into it, I just feel a bit helpless sometimes because I thought there's so much going on and there's so many sort of wheels to manoeuvre. Like how do I make that direct change or impact? Did you ever feel in, any of that or was it just me? No, that's exactly what I felt like. And I think the election, that 2010 election was the first time that there were those TV debates and they were talking about these issues that I, I cared about, social care, education, um, health care, poverty, homelessness, all these things. And I just didn't, I, you could, I didn't like the politicization, I think, of those issues. And then more so, it was also such a big arena. There was so much noise. And if you're someone who was interested in quite a specific part of it, you, I got, you get a little bit lost, I think, amongst all of that. Um, yeah, definitely. So after that, um that placement where did it where did, where did that lead on to that took me into sixth form and at that point I I knew I would I didn't want to go into I knew that I didn't want to go into politics I knew I was still interested in this area and I I really actually wanted to go to LSE you know how I mentioned that I would always watch the news and then check it against my teacher yeah. and what she'd say well just to like clarify my, uh, check my understanding she would always say to me for me hey you need to go to LSE it seems like the right uni for you at the time I was like 13 I didn't know what that was but I'd go to my dad and say I want to go to LSE <laughs> and so when I when it came to like choosing deg- degrees and everything I would look at the course at LSE and then look at what I was more interested in um and I would I was very fortunate that I had friends who were already at that uni from the year above 
and they told they told me more about like the course called social policy and it was the study of policies it was the study of like welfare the welfare state in this country but then the equivalent of the welfare state across europe and the global south it was a really broad um but then also in-depth understand study of um social structures like why is education important healthcare, social care etc and i just found out more and more about that and i got like i think i got a mentor from lsd someone who was on that course already to sort of advise me what the best approach was he advised me on things to read beforehand and then i got into uni studied that course and loved it it was amazing i am um, it was definitely the right course for me i got into lsd doing that and um kind of over the years you become a little bit more refined so you have a really broad first year second year is a bit more specific and you mm. pick up social research as a module the third year actually what made me um kind of really want to pursue social research was my dissertation and it was on the i don't know if you remember this actually but in 2016 there was a big report that came out about the high levels of muslim poverty the fact that 50 percent of the muslim population in the uk are in poverty my dissertation was sort of a direct response to that because we knew so much in social research about the ethnic penalty i think i wanted to understand what was explaining the high levels of muslim poverty in the uk at that time because it, it came across that the muslim if you look at ethno religious groups the muslim the black muslim the african muslim the caribbean muslim was always more likely in poverty than the african christian or something so i was really keen to like kind of deep dive yeah. further into that and I loved doing that dissertation. I was so uh, enthused, I was so interested. And being at LSE again was amazing because I was studying the reports that my teachers, my professors were writing. And I, it was just really, really cool actually. And that led me on to the Institute of Race Relations. I was always really specifically interested in race issues, the intersection between race and gender, the intersection between race and social mobility. Um, and I loved being there. That was in King, well, yeah, that was in central London and it was really cool. Um, however, even at that point, I knew I wanted to be in the civil service. I <laughs> had had a yeah, I'd heard a lot about the civil service, and I actually did try and apply. I think by the time I'd got in, that was my third attempt at applying to the fast stream. Really? Wow. So I always, yeah, I was always trying to get into the civil service. I think I just I had that initial curiosity, learned a little bit more about it, did some shadowing, and I thought, okay, this is definitely the place for me. Um, yeah, but yeah, yeah, I got in on my third attempt. <laughs> so what were you doing? Um, like, so whilst you're applying, because the thing civil service is you can only apply once a year, isn't it? So in between that time, what were you doing between those sort of, those those years of application windows? Were you like working <laughs> elsewhere? So the first one was while I was at uni. Um, I was going. So I was in my final year of uni. That was the first time I applied for the fast stream. The second time, I was in the Institute of Relations Race Relations job. And then third, and I would have still been there by the third one, but I was also picked up photography. I started doing wedding, wedding photography. I started making films. <laughs> I like, I did a UN migration film festival competition, all of those sorts of things. I was, I was keeping busy. I worked with kids. Um, I actually really enjoyed that time. Actually. I think it really, those smaller things, those hobbies kind of set me up really well for the civil service. Yeah. It sounds like you're sort of destined for it in, in a way like from that young <laughs> age from a teacher giving you the advice to go to LSE studying that social research module and everything you did afterwards it literally sounds like you were a career civil servant even before you began in, in the civil service but and that sounds really interesting I know for me like I had no idea what the civil service was until my dad saw like a ad on some free newspaper that says civil service fast track apprenticeship so he applied for it the salary looks good that was literally it and then from there i applied and the rest is history i've been there for over five years now i've seen a lot i've learned a lot which i would have never done and because i yeah for me i really had no idea about these sort of issues i was just, i didn't have that familiarity was on your side it sounded like you kind of had a much clearer picture and the fast stream social research stream was pretty much designed for you in mind but how was that um transitioning from because yeah how was it transitioning from education from LSE to you know employment of fast stream like was there any that generally from because a lot of people listening to this are going to be those that are probably looking to get into the first grad schemes or apprenticeships or whatever it is how was that transition period for you were there any challenges you faced 
and how did you try to overcome them? Yeah, uh, I really prefer working <laughs> to studying. So I really enjoyed it. I think there was that initial transition. If you don't have something lined up after, after you graduate, I, I see it with my younger brother. I see it with the young people. It's hard. You get a bit of like, anxiety because you just don't know, especially during this time we're in during a pandemic. Mm. If the times are uncertain for, un un for an uncertain amount of time that like we just don't know what, what's going on. And there's that added layer of pressure. I think people need to respond to that by adding a lot more flexibility and leniency to how they see their career being. Um, for me, in terms of the transition, it was a really positive one. I love working. I, I think when you graduate, you just um, really have to take more responsibility for your life. Things like what time you wake up in the morning, what time you go to bed. Um, and I think it gives you that routine that you that was absent during university because of your timetable. Um, and I really like that. I think obviously earning your own money is always really nice. Mm. Um, and just your time is a lot more free because you're not studying after uni. Your your time in the evening is completely free. Your time on the weekend is completely free. I, I really, really enjoy that. I think for me personally, getting into the civil service because I got in on my third go, I was so kind of clear on my intentions. I was so refined in my skills. I was so confident, like I was so ready for the job at that point. <laughs> but actually it was a really nice, it really worked in my favor because I, I was so, I kind of had a strong start. In, into the actual job interestingly for me one big issue was how I managed stress and I don't know if this has come up for anyone I think when you're a student you do have stress for a levels for uh, exam periods but the, there's an end point to that I think and um, they kind of the stress sort of goes after your exams are done for me that was like the biggest challenge was oh now I'm in this job that I really worked hard for my expectations for myself are so high I'm never going to meet them because they're that high, not because I'm not achieving or performing. And that was something that I had to learn in my first year of the fast stream was um, I'm going to make mistakes throughout the whole time, not just in my first year. Um, and actually, you need to change the way you think about yourself. You need to change the way you think about uh, mistakes and jobs. And you need to really become resilient. And I think that's a key skill of being in any job, being, being quite resilient. Yeah, and that's really interesting. Because your sort of stress came from really setting that high expectation of yourself. And I think probably a lot of grads where they might have that as well, where, you know, they, they're coming into a whole new office, a whole new grad scheme, and they might be very, very worried about setting a really a good impression, right? And trying to really deliver, hit the ground running and really thinking, okay, I need to be someone that's going to make that impression, that's going to smash it up from the start and, you know, get up to the top within like a few years time but I think perhaps realizing that you know it's very very likely that you will make mistakes but that's fine that's part of the process and you know not not expecting that and I think I, I, I had like a conversation recently with somebody and they felt mm -hmm. that as well they feel like an anxiety that they don't know you know what to expect or they, 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 they think they might not really deliver what, what they should be delivering but it's, it's just it's just knowing that they're not really expecting you to know everything from the start. They're not expecting you to, you know, have all the knowledge and hit the ground running. They, they know you're, you're a grad or an apprentice and they know it's going to take you some time to get around it. And naturally, you'll make a few mistakes to learn the ropes and to learn how things work. But I think as long as, and something that you definitely had was the energy and the curiosity and the interest to learn and pick up as much as you can, mm. then I think that perhaps are the key ingredients to really make the most of a grad scheme from the start and, and start making that good impression. Do you think that's a, a right assessment of that? Yeah, I think that's correct. And I think it's, I, I saw a quote the other day that said honour, that was saying honour the position that you're in now, like honour your status right now. I really think people who are entering a job for the first time should honour their beginner status <laughs> um, and embrace that. Because when you're actually um, at the early point of your career and you don't have the responsibility attached to your grade, um, I think you actually can then bring forward a lot of ideas and you don't have to be responsible for them not working out. You can be the ideas person and be like, I think we should do this. I think we should do that. Um, and it's up to your managers, your senior managers to kind of like analyse or assess the risk of things. But that's definitely what I did. And I think those things don't just start when you're really, really senior. They start from the beginning. And actually in the social research profession, it's not the like higher grades that are the creme de la creme of the profession. It's the 
HEO, SEO roles that are so pivotal to that, to the work that they do, like the social profession, social research profession does anyway. Does that make sense? Yeah. I don't know if you can relate to that at all. Yeah, I think when I um started, yeah, yeah definitely as, as an apprentice, there, there wasn't, like, I was doing the real work and everything, but they always knew that I was an apprentice. So the expectation level or the, you know, the need to deliver 100% or go further wasn't really there because they just, just knew I, I'm really new. Um, not going to know everything but i'm picking up the ropes gradually and to an extent it does give you that freedom because when i want you to do like other stuff or shadow or go see other things they were more open to that because they knew i'm an apprentice and i should be um you know this is like a development scheme for me so perhaps mm-hmm. i should be they should be letting me do different things and seeing different stuff so i can figure out the wider areas of the business and how it works and then yeah once you do get established and you know once you once i complete that apprenticeship and go into the more HEO SEO roles and I've well currently HEO I had an interview recently yeah. for SEO role but that's another story um <laughs> there but then I think when you're when you're there then you then you're starting to deliver the actual stuff and you realize you're at, at those grades you're doing a lot of the legwork that's not really mm-hmm. seen and you do have that element of responsibility because once you get about higher then it's literally direction you know somebody just kind of overseeing it and make sure you're doing the work whereas when you're at that sort of HEO SEO and even to an extent, the grade seven kind of grades, you are more or less delivering and doing what's actually required and having to own it as well, which is um, it's an interesting point. Because I was talking about it yesterday um, to um, uh, Zane. So he's, he's a, um, a network engineer and apprentice. And his line manager mm-hmm. said to him at the start of his apprenticeship, they say yes to everything. And I think for him, like for an apprentice or someone coming in new for a grad, that, that's probably a good thing. So you can really see different stuff and get exposed to everything. Not, over, not to overwhelm yourself, but to really get a grasp of everything that's ongoing. But for me, I was like, I'm five years in my career and I try to say no to most things now because yeah. I'm the, sort of more of the manager, more of the owner of my area of work. So I now have a much better idea of what's actually going to work for me and what's actually going to lead to an outcome and what's actually just, you know, like just, just, like a nice to have sort of meeting so that that was a very interesting uh two different perspectives there but i think definitely at the start you know that expectation isn't there so you've got that freedom to go out do different things get that exposure and definitely make the most of it and it's fun as well because you have that little freedom you meet other people that are on the same stream as well or same scheme or other young people and you have that kind of cool um nice vibe and yeah it, it, it works out a lot better and i think it's something people should own and enjoy and not feel um too anxious about but on the topic of Definitely. the um social research stream were there any other yeah. kind of related grad schemes or areas of work you're looking at outside of fast stream or was it particularly at fast stream was your main precise goal so um so because i was in a, in a think tank before i was working i was doing a lot of research i think my issue was that we were pr- producing all of this research and it just wasn't landing anywhere <laughs> Um, because you're just not close to the policy or the decisions. If you're a research organization, you really, you need the other side. The other side of research is the policy or the decision making. And I think that's what kind of really made me interested in the civil service. I actually didn't apply for any direct entry jobs um, or anything like that. I don't know why at the time. I think I was so, I liked what I was reading about the fast stream. And even though I didn't get into my final go, I got closer with each round each year. <laughs> um so i just thought well i can there's no reason why i can't if i don't try again I, there's no reason why i can't get it um and i like the kind of development side the leadership side i definitely just had so much confidence now look back at that age <laughs> um, i had so much confidence and i like, believed in myself that i would actually really do well on the fast stream so i didn't apply to anything else actually and i, I really should have i mean i was I was in like lots of small jobs for a long time, I think, because I was waiting for the, the annual application. Yeah, yeah. yeah. An interesting topic uh, point you mentioned about the confidence that you had and yeah, you know, th- that 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 real that, yeah that confidence that superpower. Because I, I know sometimes like for especially for like young Muslim sisters when they're thinking about mm. the career when they think about how to fit in, you know how to dress as a Muslim, all that kind of stuff, and trying to, you know, fit into the whole corporate environment. Did you kind of have similar thoughts there? Or how did you, um, you know, really drive that confidence and, and develop that? And you know, to, to the extent that, you know, you knew that this would be for you and that, you know, you would be able to go in and do well. 
Yeah, I think it's a really good point. And I, I saw in, in your video as well that you like had this, you disaggregated the statistics between men and women and the difference. I, like there was one on um, whether they had contacts in professions or something and the difference between males and females in the Muslim community. I was really surprised by like at this point that we're in. Hmm. Um, for me personally, I think I had that confidence um, from a young age, I'd say definitely. I, I think being at uni was amazing because I didn't grow up amongst a lot of Muslims at all. So all of a sudden I was in a central London university around Muslims who were exactly like me in terms of the, amb the ambition and all of those sorts of things. I think that does a lot to boost your own confidence because you're around people who are like you, who you can also then learn so much from. Um, and I think I just got in, got so involved while I was at uni in various things that I was, I feel like one of the best ways to build confidence in something that you're not confident in originally in it is to spend more time on it, to build your knowledge in it to learn more about it. And I think I was doing that at uni. I think I was around really amazing people, whether they, they're probably like informally mentors, not formally. Yeah. Um, and I think just, I don't know. I don't know where I got the confidence. I think I always had it, <laughs> if I'm being honest. I mean, I think I was in in really, really good environment. But that, that, that makes a difference though, doesn't it? Like sometimes we can even yeah. forget that you might not necessarily really need to do anything in particular, but it's the people you're surrounded by, the environment you're surrounded by, the positivity like you're surrounded by. If you're surrounded by negativity, if, for example, let's say, you know, you're, you've got a social media Twitter feed and it's all people posting negative stuff. And naturally, the more you consume that, the more sort of negativity you're putting into your mind, the, the more like kind of negative kind of outputs will come out and, and it will just start to put you down. Whereas if, for example, let's say this is a really specific, narrow example, but let's say it was all kind of positive stuff you're seeing on your timeline and stuff like that and things that encourage you to grow, to do more, to be better, then actually when that stuff is going into your mind, then the positive thoughts leads to more positive outcomes. And it's not even just that. It's like that, yeah. that's like one element of the environment, but people that your friends, are they encouraging you or are they putting you down? Are they pushing you to go further or are they sort of, you know, holding you back in a way to say, you know, that's not really realistic or I can't see you achieving that? Because I think in our community, like, especially within the families, like there's always some sort of comparison where, especially with um, GCSE GCC grades and A-level grades, I, I had that in my family, where they'll mm. compare you to your relatives who are like much smarter and be like, why didn't you get those A-stars and, you know, those 12 A-stars or whatever yeah. it is. And you're just thinking, what? Like, how, how can they expect that of me? Rather, rather, it wasn't even a thing where that kind of comparison really isn't a environment that instills confidence or that kind of pushes you in a positive way. Rather, it's, it was more of a negative kind of thing or negative reinforcement that you're kind of pitting people against each other and naturally you're not creating that environment of positivity and encouraging each other to you know to do well rather you're putting each other against each other and thinking are you really happy for that person and I think as a community we probably have that quite a lot and I think that really does um, doesn't really help the situation but it sounds like from from your side you really had a lot of those positive influences yeah definitely and i think i was i joined the islamic society at university and that was probably like i i feel so in debt to that because it was and it was amazingly structured amazing run and it it, it gave you a sense of um ob not obligation in like a sense of duty and role and um responsibility towards something bigger than yourself <laughs> yeah um and it was just so inspiring because the people that i, I was around with were, they were already doing those things they were already making their mark um, and that really helped me. And it, it was kind of like multi-layered, but like it wasn't just kind of a building your aspiration and exposing you to the civil service and things like that. It was really developing your actual skills. How well are you able to speak in public? Those sorts of things. I think just that com combination does equip you well for like the outside world, I'd say. Definitely. And public speaking, especially if you can get yeah. up and do a presentation, even in front of a small group of people and build from there. Like for me, that that was probably the, the kickstarter for my confidence in my career. Like I didn't really have it until I started in my diverse events coordinator role where I was very socially anxious and I didn't want to ever present. Yeah. Even even in a meeting, I didn't want to present on anything. I didn't want to talk. I just I tried to avoid it where I could. But when I went to that, that role, within a few weeks, there's an opportunity to present in front of like 100 fast tumors. And I don't know why, but I just took it. And yeah the presentation was like it, it, i delivered it but the audience that day were really harsh they kept asking all these really difficult questions and i was like this is like my first ever thing in two weeks in my brand new role and they're asking me about <laughs> why 
why aren't we targeting this group of you know diverse students or why aren't we you know making the forestry assessment center more mobile and more accessible i'm like i don't know so thinking my language was there and i just sent post over <laughs> to him but i think doing yeah. that like and and even though probably could have been seen as a flop and as a disaster but i think even though i did that i still felt a massive confidence boost from that and just mm. just get myself out there really was a kickstart to you know far more development and pushing myself to the boundaries that i didn't ever perceive i would do from before and this is even when i was in government and, and in employment so i think it, it can start at any age and but the earlier you start it the better i think um definitely 100 yeah. percent. it's interesting that public speaking i feel like it, that's that's the that's the one for most people it, for me i have like a i have a thing i get a wobbly voice i could be in a job for like five years and then randomly one week deliver a presentation the week before i would have been really clear really coherent really confident the week after i'd be really wobbly like it just i don't know it, it, sometimes the nerves get the best of you but it definitely improves the more and more practice yeah yeah the more the more you do i think the more i guess competence yeah. creates that more confidence which is somebody told me that and i was like yeah that actually makes a, a lot of sense but moving yeah. on now to the actual far stream social research stream it's a bit of a mouthful to say that fast yeah. um what's it actually like you know the actual the actual scheme how does it work yeah um it's really good it's so social research in the government it's the study of or it's the you know the study of social trends to either inform policy or it's the evaluation of policies that are already there um in terms of the fast stream i think it's recently changed i think it's three years long now that you have a home department in your first two years um and it's, it makes sense to be in a, in a one placement for that long because you really do want to see research projects from scoping to the delivery of the analysis, it takes a lot of time. It's not a, it's not fast paced at all. It's a very it's not a slow paced. It's not slow paced, but in comparison to yeah. other bits of delivery in civil civil service, it isn't. Um, it does take time. Things span a long time, years or a year or six months or something. Um, so it makes sense to be in your first part for two years because you will just get so much experience and so much knowledge and. Um, so many skills that like you really do develop a, a wide range of skills if you stay in a place for a while you develop them anyway regardless if you stay in a place uh, for a long time or not but yeah so you stay in your first apartment for two years and then you're you do an assessment after the two years to just check you're on track and you're you're at that level um you're at a certain level because when you do your final year you'd have a final assessment scheme and that will be to make sure you're at that grade seven point i think but it's not how i've done it my scheme is an older version of that one how did you do yours was it um yeah so that's how you did yours that, that'd be still be good good to, good to know and, and yeah so um sorry, my yeah go on sorry no my family are just walking in and out so if i'm looking around <laughs> it's because of them I, they're just there's no discretion or anything sorry i'm really sorry that's no, um, fine it's fine don't worry um my experience so when i joined so the, the government social research fast stream, just to kind of counter any confusion, recently had a big, like it was revised by cabinet office by the government social research scheme itself. Um, so my scheme when I first joined was designed to be three to five years long. Um, yeah. But there isn't actually, like, there isn't actually a clear structure. So I didn't follow the conventional fast stream structure in that I got, the, I got a temporary promotion a year and a half into my fast stream that does take you out of the traditional classroom route basically um so i don't know what i'm actually doing but <laughs> i'm not worried oh <laughs> i think it's because um so from from my time at civil service hr and working on fast stream so i think if i'm correct the social research stream isn't centrally managed as such Perhaps, so yeah. maybe for departments you're in they kind of have like a informal sort of structure so maybe now they've improved it as you mentioned they've, they've put something in place now whereas before it was more just you know here is the fast streamer and you guys can kind of shape it as you want so whether that's one year placements across different areas in the cabinet office or keeping like somebody in the same department for like, the whole duration um it, it can be very flexible with non-centrally managed schemes i think centrally managed schemes like the generalist um dida and what does it i can think of right now but they're, they're much more coordinated and they have those much more regular yeah sort of six month or I think they're changing it now to nine or 12 months placements. 
so they fix it a lot more yeah. and they do a lot more management with all of that and, and there's a lot more investment I think work in the central HR department to, to facilitate that but where was your sort of first placement or your first role what department was that in or are you still in that same department in the, I'm still in that same department it's um, the, called the valuation office agency are you familiar with that one VOA. really yeah VOA um, and it's an agency executive agency of HMRC so it's like our parent government parent department is HMRC and I don't know if, if, if I don't expect many people to know about it, but if anyone is familiar with business rates or council tax, we are the depart- we are the agency that deals with those two big tax areas. So um, that's what we do. It's not a traditional social research department mm. in that if I was to work at something like MHCRG, where you're looking at things like communities and inclusion and how different groups of people are working together, housing, those things are big social research, really interesting areas of work. This one isn't um, in terms of the actual... Uh, policy areas it's still meaningful that we still have value but I definitely do a lot more of the organizational uh, data work so it's all about supporting the department on DNI strategies things like social mobility we do a lot of work on um, we do a lot of work on like start like the or, I don't know how to say but just organizational research through so like the people survey yeah I lead on the analysis of that and things like that yeah no, that sounds really interesting and I think we'll get a, a, a bit more into that soon Mm -hmm. um so so when you start like you're more or less a sort of basically your your, your job title was pretty much throughout the whole duration like a social research fast more or less isn't it and as you go along and go through assessments you gradually sort of are there any um like qualifications or anything that you do for this particular stream yeah well you have to have the government social research badge um, and that and you get you, you go through that at different levels so when you start at the fast stream the final selection board in the fast stream is your heo badge essentially um and you do uh, a knowledge test you do another you do i can't remember right now oh my god you do a knowledge test a technical exercise i think or an oral briefing an interview and that get, that should give you the pass for um for your heo uh not qualification but HEO badge to be a social researcher you also have to have your degree your degree should contain I think 30% social research um so they do want to see that I think it's different if you have a master's but um and then with each promotion you get you'd have to do another assessment so another technical test another oral briefing at that higher level to show that you've developed a, a social research method to that point um so yeah okay okay so it's it's not like a formal qualification as such but it's more of a kind of testing the knowledge and the competence and the, those sort of skills that are needed at the different levels so you, you basically yeah so you, you get badged at each sort of grade which is um quite a interesting way of um doing it I, I think i've come across that term badging before when i used to so i used to work yeah. in the business support for the um uh, i think it was an analysis team an economist team and they used to mention a lot about badging in, in, in different sort of uh, research research kind of roles so it's quite it's like a different way but um interesting um thing to do there and would you say this this sort of um career or this sort of stream really ties into people that are really interested in subjects like sort of sociology psychology and government and politics i think that might be the perfect yeah. combination wouldn't it for this yeah at one point in my team i think everyone had done a psychology degree apart from me <laughs> Um, but yeah, it really lends itself well. If you've done those, and my manager's done a sociology degree, if you um, are in those subjects, I think, uh, yeah, those are exactly, yeah, actually, anyone who's interested in those topics. Um, it really, like, it's just a natural next step from that degree, I'd say. Yeah, yeah. And that's the thing as well. I, like, when I'm, I'm sure many, like, it's about me generalizing a lot, but I think from my experience in college, a lot of, the Muslim students I met always had an interest in one of those subjects. Either it was politics, either it was psychology or sociology, maybe all of them. But nobody really knew that, you know, there could be a sort of career in this field that can lead on to like far stream government and combining policy and social research and all those elements together. So I think this this should definitely be yeah. really interesting for those that are like, listening and have that interest. Cause I, I think there's loads of them that are out there just don't really know exactly what those qualifications can lead to in terms of next steps and, and careers but this is like 
a proper tangible one that combines all those um elements together so i think that that should be um quite an exciting thought for those that are you know thinking about this and, and really thinking you know what does sociology lead to what does psychology maybe lead to or government politics yeah. and this is something that's definitely a um <laughs> the perfect yeah the perfect combination of all of them um I, it, yeah go on. sorry it's just interesting because you're right when i was studying it i, I I mean, I was exposed to it, but I wouldn't think everyone else would be. It was only through my own like personal research, I'd say, into social research that I learned. But it's not. I think it's a known thing. The civil service is known, but yeah, the various different professions, especially because you you might think often, oh, I don't know how to make an impact with this interest, but you really can through that through that social research profession or other analytical professions. Yeah, and this is this is exactly why I sort of started this podcast again because like someone like me, I had no idea. Even like f- forget social research. I don't know about civil service and government as a whole. So, you know, I think there's there's that big disparity. Um, we come from college or we have pretty much college and to an extent university where you just don't know what those next steps look like. You just don't know what careers are really there because you, you don't hear the stories. You don't have those those networks or those connections yeah. to find out what is it that's there and how does it actually work? You know, what is the career path? What, yeah. what, what does the day look like in the, in the office? And stuff like that and this is a, a massive disconnect and i think i i'm probably going off a slight assumption but based on the support of the research i've done that, that survey i think it really does support that they would really benefit by number one seeing other muslims in these careers and number two actually getting an insight into what's out there because yeah maybe if you had a, you in your case i think you get a really clear idea of, of what you sort of want yeah. to do which is, which is great and i think it's more of how can we get more young Muslims in that boat to have an understanding of what they want to do next and how can they really get that insight and maybe use tools like LinkedIn and stuff like that to you know dip in try to arrange some sort of uh, unofficial mentoring um try to get some shadowing or stuff like that but it, it, it's massive when you're at that young age you've got to make a big decision but you just don't know what it actually looks like and you have all these interests in these amazing subjects but it's a sad thing is like again that there's just that gap and hopefully this this will be one way to try to you know bridge yeah. that gap a little bit and give an insight into some of that social research which would be which is a big subject of interest i think yeah i have two points um first of all have you read chav by owen jones no it talks about do you have the curiosity to read chav by owen jones because it talks about what you're talking about the the fact that people can't can't aspire to things that they, they don't know about so you need to expose them to certain things so they can aspire to these things um and there's like a big regional split obviously people and i'm i'm from a bain community but i'm bain in london it's completely different to being bain in i don't know another part of the uk yeah <laughs> um, like yorkshire or like yeah yeah oh south, yeah east south west exactly. kent exactly but the your i grew up in went to school in south london and then you're not too far away from where i'm not too far away from the uni that i went to if that makes sense either and then you regularly see whitehall and westminster and it really does inspire you i feel like um secondly i've had this the kind of point that actually if you really want to make change it's the kind of 14 16 year old age that group where you can really create the most influence i think because at that point you can really build the aspiration, build that motivation, mm. and they're at the point where they it's like pivotal. They can kind of change the direction yeah. of their career or their life at that point. Yeah, they do, they do say it's to, good. We've got a young population amongst Muslims as well. Yeah, hundred percent. And yeah, they do say to intervene at that at that age. And I think definitely, if, even if somebody told me like whether it was a when 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 I, when I reflect back on how I was in that fourteen sixteen age, I probably wouldn't have cared as much. But I think. But then this is again for me from my own sort of lived experience. But I think once I went to college, because when, when you start in college, that's, that's when you start thinking about university and start thinking about okay, what are the real next steps now? Because I've done my GCSEs, that's the wide reading subjects. I've done my A levels, that's like four subjects. Now I need to narrow that down to like one thing, either it's going to be an apprenticeship or a degree. So now I've got to think about okay, what can I actually get from this afterwards? And yeah, you're right. There, there really needs to be, you know, more exposure and more, you know, people who've seen people that they can relate to in these different areas and understanding that it, it is possible and that it's, it's within reach. It's not out of scope. But I wanted to get into um, so something that's quite important, I think, for young people to try to visualize. What does a typical day or work week look like? You know, being a sort of social researcher. Yeah. 
but I work in a really nice swanky office if that helps motivate anyone yeah I think so. <laughs> and <Yeah>. then um <laughs> it is very nice actually um got lots of nice shops and restaurants nearby too just setting the scene and then um as a social researcher on the fast stream you, there's two elements of being on the fast stream as a social researcher actually you've got the leadership development side so you you would be being mentored by your senior civil servants and that's probably one month and you'd be going especially in your first year you'd be going to a lot of trainings a lot of development um courses those sorts of things to build your, your leadership skills and then you've got your actual day job which is being a social researcher um, and you will never not be on a social research project. There's a lot of demand for what we do in the government. And um, I think a typical day would be either, you'd always be working with someone else, not in your team. So you'd, your research would be either commissioned by the policy colleagues or by um, people in the department who want specific research, like people group or HR or something. Um, and either you'd be kind of having meetings with them in person or on the phone or on Skype or things like that um to kind of divide research questions or to update them on your research you're always presenting your findings as you're finding them does that make sense um i think you'd have meetings with your managers so my manager isn't based in my same office she's based in another one um so i'd have regular one-to-ones with her i'm also a line manager i have one-to-ones with the person i manage um and then also because you're part of a wider team or directorate i appreciate that they don't really mean much at this point but you're just part of a bigger teams hmm. so your teams will often meet and you'll have big team meetings uh and they're quite fun they can actually be you either like learn more about what the rest of the department is doing um you can show and present your work um yeah or you can kind of do things that are like developmental again like for, for the team you can learn skills you have away days is it like, like a community it, yeah but we're a small yeah I was going to say that we're a small department, but I think everyone would have a similar experience of that actually in the office. It's definitely like a community. Yeah, because if I recall from my sort of time doing that business support role for the economists, and I think there were, I think either a social researcher or a statistician, or maybe both, um, probably was both, because my deputy director reported was the chief economist, so I'm sure she looked into d- different areas. But from what I gathered, so you, it's pretty much what you, what you sort of said, where you'd be in a team you support different <laughs> policy areas but then yeah like you'd sort of have like a little community for your profession so if you're an economist there's like a wider economist like group of economists in the department that might yeah. do get togethers and learning experiences or mentoring or different stuff and if you're like a um i think probably social researchers they probably have something similar or a statistician and yeah it sounds like there, there's elements there's, so you've got, you've got your team where you might go and work in different other policy areas depending on that director and what the sort of area of work is in terms of the policy then you've got your sort of wider community where you can kind of get that support and that knowledge and you know have that, that knowledge sharing element which is quite cool because you have that sense of um, more sense of a belonging and, and more sense of you know you know people in a similar profession that can give you support so there's far less likely of a chance that you might feel a bit isolated or might feel oh, I'm just on in this on my own but there's like a group of people that are in the same boat that understand the yeah. role and all of that. And, and you have access to that, which I think is really important, especially when you might be very new to a department or even a profession like social research. Definitely. And I think, so yeah, you're, you're linked because you're, you're part of the wider government social research profession and that's all the social researchers and all the departments. Um, and you just have like a member site. And I, I do, I'm, I'm on task and finish groups to support projects for the government social research profession as a whole so that's really good you are part of something bigger you do have access to them and you do have those contacts um and i have friends that i've like that i made through that work and it's, it's cool because you're not just confined to your department at all um but then also being a fast streamer you you are immediately in this cohort in your department of all the other fast streamers across all the different schemes so we were brought together every month through our senior civil servant who would give us like monthly uh, mentor sessions and kind of support our development a lot more and then um what were they saying (laughs) and then so and then we'd also go to things like uh, we'd have breakfast together and dinners together and lunches together we all kind of grouped together and it was really nice everyone was kind of supporting everyone else's careers and yeah it was it was good very proactive 
No, that's that's definitely important to have, uh, especially you know, it, 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 it sounds like there's a very good, strong um, community vibe there, which yeah. it, 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 it is definitely important, definitely hundred percent important. Um, are there any highlights that you can share in terms of what areas you worked in or something that you you thought was really kind of cool when you started in the fast stream? <laughs> oh, I noticed as well that you're on. I was I went on the Fortune website and I saw you there. I was like, wait, you're really familiar. <laughs> yeah. yeah, um, I like doing that. Actually, being yeah, so you're I'm the GSR Fortune ambassador, which is very cool. It's um, and I liked it because I had friends from uni who were probably still at uni at that point, and they just said it. It's important to see people like you on things like that, and that's exactly what you do it for, I suppose. Um, but a highlight at work, I think when you can, and I'm sure you relate to this, but when you can actually do what your job is. <laughs> um, so when you're kind of in a meeting and you can say, well, actually, no, this is, the, this is what the evidence says, this is what the research says, or we're not going to change the wording of that, we're going to keep it like it is. Um, it's a really nice role to have in government. I think just being in this profession, it allows you, and this is why like, representation amongst this profession is really, really important because you get you're given this big data set and then they want you to kind of have your own uh like hypothesis of that if that kind of lands with anyone they want you to have an idea of what you're looking for that's going to be determined by who how your mind works and who you are as a person just naturally you're going to look for things like i for example when i when i saw like the data for organizational research come in immediately i looked at stress levels amongst different grades because i was so interested in that and i was able to like kind of pull that out and get this data on the fact that actually lower grades had high reported levels of stress um, and I, I like the the kind of the freedom that it really does exist within the profession you can drive the direction of the work that you do you can drive the direction of the research that you do in a way that's completely um, in line <laughs> in a, and that supports policy but it, you can also kind of identify things that should be emerging that things should if they're not looking at it now they should be looking at it um, it just does give you so much influence i'd say yeah and that really leads me nicely onto my next point which is the importance of you know having sort of muslims in these sort of roles do you think like, you so you've been on the stream for a few years now what does the the diversity look like in these sort of roles and do you think there is real need mm -hmm. and importance for muslims to consider these sort of um kind of roles in government or in any context yeah i i think Oh, I have two parts. Um, firstly, there's a need for Muslims everywhere in any, every profession. I, I, again, I saw it on your um, your website. Like, there's so many different kind of strands and streams of work that Muslims are interested in doing. I think, not to be biased, the civil service have include a lot of them, <laughs> which is a good thing. But um, more than that, in my own experience, it's not diverse. It really isn't. I yeah and there's no kind of sugar coating or glossing that over you can't it's we have all the conversations about black lives matter we don't have the black colleagues we're leading that discussion in the department it is an issue and i think in terms of the profession in the gsr government social research profession they there really does need to be that diversity and that representation otherwise you're having this kind of dominant perspective and you really do like you do have that dominant perspective um if you're not getting people from different backgrounds, different religions, different classes, different regions, um, I think it is really important. You need it everywhere, I say. And I think you need confident minority groups everywhere. Um, representation is meant to be transformative. It's meant to bring about change. I think we should really kind of encourage young people to use their voice, stand in their own power a little bit more. They have lots to offer, lots to contribute. and it's that thing of like you you don't want to just be kind of part of something you don't want the civil service to transform you you want to transform the civil service if that makes sense 100 um, and i think that's what we need more about and i think we're at this kind of like halfway point where we are getting that representation but we need to, to make more noise i think about things that are going on and then also still get that representation because we're nowhere near that anyway yeah 100 percent. and i think those words yeah that's spot on um especially with um like for example when i've been looking into the social mobility stuff I, i've been reaching out to different people in government and there's not really any sort of muslims in that sort of space like like the social mobility team or whoever it is that, that are looking into like some of the issues that i mentioned with um, young muslims and 
like I've realized as well, like part of it is driven by, it's slightly um, annoyed me a bit, but it's slightly driven by the perm cycle, the minister's agenda. But at the same time, like I'm not, I'm trying to find those Muslims that might be in that kind of influential role in a social mobility team mm-hmm. or doing that kind of work that can actually push that voice for them. Because I think for me, I'm just <laughs> the guy from HR trying to amplify it where I can. But it probably needs to be a bit more joined up. And I've had some response from the cross social mobility team and they're like, we can help with outreach. But I'm thinking it needs to be more than outreach. It needs to be, you know, are we, are, are Muslims included in the discussions about social media that you guys are talking about? When you're, you know, doing your analysis of different groups, you group a lot of the minor ethnics into BAME. But even BAME, like the intersectionality piece, that, that really isn't there. But there isn't that voice, I think, for somebody to say that, you know, what we need to look at this in a much more detail and depth to get the information and insight we need for these minor ethnic communities and, you know, groups like Muslims, where it's already been shown by the Social Mobility Commission that there mm. is a, a barrier there. But since that report in 2017, they're not really looked into that again. And it's just trying to, yeah, that's why I think, you know, areas like the social research and in government, combining that together can really drive it from like a whole other angle and internally, which I think is really important to, you know, make yeah. people aware of this particular stream and get them encouraging them to you know apply and, and um go for it and that led me to, to another point which has completely slipped my mind now but <laughs> yeah fundamentally i think yeah it, it's, re- it's really important for social research and yeah. having, having muslims there because people yeah it's social issues isn't it like you need to understand the social issues and you're not going to get it unless you're really from that background upbringing and have a real insight into what these issues actually are and what they actually mean because from an outsider view, you just don't, you won't ever really truly understand it. And I think the essence of that social research and that perspective and that bringing that point of view, you know, it, it all is really important. And I think you definitely need, you know, more Muslims in these roles if you want to drive that work further. Yeah, yeah. D- definitely. definitely. And I think the social, social research is about getting closest to the truth so that you can identify something, then you can target policy accordingly. I think if you've not got that diversity, think about how many people are, uh, affected by things that happen in our society it's not just one one ethnicity that it's a completely mixed um community it that needs to be reflected in the people that study them if that makes sense yeah. in order to really understand exactly what the issue is um but yeah yeah because you can be... i think we need muslim leadership in social research not just muslim social researchers as well yeah because you can be given data but you don't really know the real context of it unless you've lived or have like a more of a lived experience of that and you know come from that background and know what it means for that and it's, it's only going to support you know the whole government work and policy work to be more inclusive which is you know one of the biggest agendas always mentioned is dni but i think there definitely needs to be yeah. a lot more you know work in that space to, to make it right but moving on nicely now to the assessment set now, now we, don't, we don't need to get into it in, in all the details because yeah. i know you've done it three times and you're probably fed up of <laughs> talking about it and reliving those experiences yeah. again but I guess because I've got I've got another episode that's focused solely on it, so you've got okay. like a chance to, you know, pick any stage of the assessment center where you think you know you can give the most advice on how you addressed it and how you kind of passed it. Is there any um, stage that you think made me fail before, but you learned how to get better and have any advice to share on it? I feel like my third time doing it, I was good at every single round. And I'll tell you why, because <laughs> it was, you know, the civil service behavior framework at the time it was called a competency framework, but the civil service behavior framework, you're, if you're on the classroom, you're entering at level three, HEO, SEO role level. I would study that level for every single behavior. Um, and that set me up really well for every round of the application, actually, because it gets you thinking in the way that civil servants do. It helps you and really like read it, ask questions. You ask me the questions, either anyone, um, if you need to kind of check your understanding a little bit further. But that that was like the game changer, being really familiar with that framework, what skills actually look like, what they mean in the civil service context. is exactly what they're, they're um, kind of marking you on throughout the whole process. So it wasn't even like there was a big jump from my initial like online test to my to my social research um final selection board it was the same sort of thinking all the way through just different applications of it yeah that was all rounder <laughs> <laughs> no definitely and i'm guessing like going through 
or well, doing it three times I'm just like being familiar with the process definitely helped as well and one of the advices I try to give to people is you know just to try even like if you might be in your early years of university there's no harm in you just applying for a different different scheme and just going through the application stage just to get familiar with it so once yeah. your time comes you'll be much um, better equipped to you know deal with them the, the assessments and, and the tasks um, but I think that's more of like a little little gaming way where even though you might not necessarily be eligible, even you just just make an application, they're not exactly going to check. But you can just go through the assessments, the real life proper assessments, and learn and figure out how it actually works and what they're actually looking for, and translating stuff like the success profiles, competency framework into oh, yeah, exactly. things that actually make sense and how it actually relates to those situation judgment tests, those kind of e exercises and video interview questions and stuff like that i think you could definitely um yeah. play around with it a bit and you know make the most of it um and practice everything practice yeah. everything and if you with the assessment centers any you know don't find start create the opportunity to, to experience um like for example the group exercise feeling the heat before you actually have the real thing is really important actually once you've done one practice you're pretty much set like ready for doing it and in the real in a real setting yeah but that's one thing i i did differently from <laughs> attempt two to three was that i practiced a lot and um, beforehand were there so for the social research stream was there any additional assessments which is i guess important yeah. to mention um yeah we had to do a separate application in terms of uh you have another basically online application form that you have to fill in that's all tailored towards social research it's where you put in your modules it's where you you answer directly why you want to be in the government social research profession specifically and then you have to pass pass that round to then get onto the final selection board and um, the good thing about the final selection board is that it's tailored towards social research and if you're applying to something that's very specific anyway it's not going to catch you out in fact it's going to really make you realize what your skills are and how equipped you actually are for the role and the social research final selection board it set me up so well for my first year of the job um just what you have to prepare for um it, it makes you aware of all the social research methods out there the ethics behind things government social research um in well, obviously in government the kind of things that you have to consider it just put you in the right mindset i think for being a social researcher so even though it's an additional step it's probably the most valuable one to your actual career wow so at the end of the assessment center so you have to submit a sort of application form which be kind of asking the why and the motivations and then you go to the final selection board and was that like yeah. a was that more of an interview or did you have to like present something it was both it was it was like an assessment center so you had your your technical test to show that you knew technically how to do things and then you had your oral briefing which is where you were given a whole set of data you had to present on it summarize it talk about data gaps um, and then you had an interview. It was about five hours long. It was actually very enjoyable, if that makes it any easier. Yeah, <laughs> I like. I quite liked it. Yeah, I enjoyed it. It was fun. And I was, like, I was the only Bane person there, full stop. But I was so, like, confident and aware of my skills and my strengths. It didn't really put me off. In fact, I just thought I had, like, one up on everyone because I was so prepared. Like, I knew so much about government social research. So, um, yeah, I enjoyed it. Actually, the so final selection board was probably the most enjoyable one. Um, and if you're a social, if you're interested in social research, you will, yeah, enjoy that. You will like it. And this again leads me on really nicely to um, my next point. So, mm. what um, key skills do you think you need to succeed in like a social research career? And how can what things can young people do to you know best prepare them for you know social research careers and for like uh, applications? Yeah, applications that you just done, like you know, where you had to yeah. present and you know, put across your passions. I can, for example, okay, let, let's say, let's go back a bit. So let's say, um, I've left, I finished university, I've studied, let's say, something like sociology, and there was a social research module there. Now I really want to get into the social research stream. Are there is there any anything else to extra extra activities or any other things I could do to build my skills and basically give me a good chance to you know succeed and, yeah. and get in. Yeah, for your question. So I think if you're at university already, get involved with any kind of campaign or issue that you genuinely care about and 
for your own good intentions, like try and bring about some kind of change or deliver on a project um, and work with, uh, work with other people. Like if you're at university, yeah, definitely get involved in those student union campaigns and work with other people. If you're younger, if you're not at uni just yet, volunteer for social causes and just get exposed to kind of the different people that are involved with one cause or something like that. that so that's exactly what you're doing as a social researcher. I'm not, I'm never just working amongst or within my own research team. I'm always with other people because everyone is influenced by the work that I'm, not that I'm that important, but everyone's working on, everyone's influenced by the policy that I might be working on or something. And um, yeah, like so if, you're, if you're not in uni yet, do some volunteering, demonstrate that, that interest in social issues because it's a social research that's exactly what you're doing social issues what you're focusing on um and get the project management skills and communication is the main thing because you've got all this data and you're presenting always to people who aren't analysts so you might have all these numbers that are important to you but they're not important to most people they just want to know the narrative of the story you need to be able to really convincingly um convey your results and your findings in a way that's impactful to them and that requires pretty good communication skills and remember you also want your data to actually have influence so you need to be someone who's quite persuasive quite yeah, persuasive quite impactful when you speak anyway um so yeah communication project management and delivery and volunteering for social issues i think yeah because that can definitely so so yeah volunteering there's, there's a lot of different organizations that people can get stuck in with and just you know start yeah. getting involved and playing a part um I know you touched upon earlier like stuff like um, methodologies and analyzing data. Is there uh, anything in particular that a young person can maybe look into to give them a head start yeah. into certain methodologies or is that sort of covered off in university? So if you're at university, so I, the book that I, I would really recommend to anyone at university who's applying for the social research fast stream is the Bryman Social Research Method they'd probably know about it if you're not at uni just yet oh i don't know is that was your question about people who weren't at university it can be both it can be um you know wherever because i'm just thinking if i because i think for a career in social research far stream then it's more likely that you're going to need to have a degree isn't it then it's not really it's a specialist one yeah yeah it's, it's not really a career where you can't have a you can't go with it with a, with a that degree basically or, or a specific degree that's related to it so i guess yeah this is probably going to relate a lot more to those that are having to go to university and get that yeah yeah so yeah, yeah touch upon that yeah. book um and i think yeah, and then just quickly yeah go on. sorry just quickly with book recommendations so social research methods by Bryman, but the magenta book um just google it for anyone who's interested but the magenta book is what i looked at and that's social research in government and that really equips you well really sets you up well for the for the role yeah no there's, there's definitely some interesting stuff there and i think yeah because this particular career is more of a specialist one it is one that you have to go through the university degree route for which yeah i don't think they've um i know for the economist um or the economist service in government they've now developed the degree apprenticeship but they still have got like their whole degree fast stream and all of that and basically you do need a degree to get into these um, professions because it's not one of those where you can build in the generalist skills from outside and, and, and come in and, and figure your way out which i guess e each profession is, is different isn't it and maybe people didn't know that so this will also provide mm -hmm. a um a bit of clarity on that which is i think you know really helpful definitely helpful for people to start getting their head start and start thinking about how they can get stuck in and get involved in different things build up your skills public speaking um and learn how to communicate and communicate data as well I think there's probably some stuff out there yeah. you can find and how to do that in an effective way to, you know, build a narrative and build that story, I think. Storytelling. Yeah. Or, or, or and is if you're at... They call it... Sorry. Oh, no, and if I'm you're sorry. at university, if you're at university, one thing that you can do is if you're interested in something about your university makeup, the demographics of the students or something, if you're interested in something like the attainment gap, you can request that data from your student union or something. I'm really interested. I want the data on this, that shows that you're driving data production for an issue that's really important. You don't have to be anyone, you don't have to be like the president of a student union that you can be a student who has that curiosity, gets the data and then informs some kind of change because you're like, well, now we have all this information and what are we gonna do about it? That's something that's like, hopefully that, that might make it a little bit more accessible given how specialist it is. Yeah, 
No, and yeah, everything I think helps in terms of those little advices and things you can do to you know yeah. give yourself that best prep and head start and really get stuck in because I think the best way you learn is by doing it really and, and getting you can read yeah. all the theory, you can read all the books, but when you're actually doing it, that's when you really pick up everything and then pick up the soft skills alongside it and really educate yourself to another level. And I, that I can only yeah. imagine will best prepare you for any sort of role, whether it's far stream or any social social research role in government. Um, I guess yeah, this brings us pretty much to the end. We've covered a great deal of um, content and you know things about social research which perhaps people didn't or wouldn't have had exposure to before. Um, are there any sort of, I guess, last words, key reflections that you share with young Muslims? And that could be generally yeah. or that could be to like position themselves for this role, whichever you prefer. I thought I'd be general. I think generally we focus a lot on glass ceilings and I think it's more about the sticky floors sometimes that can keep people grounded where they are, if that makes sense. I think people need to believe in themselves a lot more because pe- other people will follow your confidence. <laughs> if, you're the, if you don't believe in yourself and not to scare anyone, they your energy is just so important really have that confidence and for me actually i applied to the general scheme and then i got through to the social research one and i thought well i can't do another social research final selection board i just have an extra round i don't want to do it <laughs> um yeah, but like i got scared i got like oh i can't do this a friend told me that if god gets you to a situation god will get you through that situation 100 percent. and you're imp- like don't worry that something requires hard work or that something is hard it's never because of you that you get it, but it's not. It's because of God's, God's work, God's efforts. So be empowered through that and don't, we can do everything, we can do anything. And I think um, you may as well learn it now at this young age, but you're going to realize it when you're like 15 years older, that just stand, in, I, I always say this, but like trust in yourself, stand in your own power. If you aren't confident with something, something, a specific skill, learn more about that. Invest in yourself. It's really important and give things give things a go like don't let you be the reason why that you haven't you haven't done something if that makes sense i just think confidence is a big one 100 percent, 100 percent. that's one of the pillars of this whole um sort of project yeah, and what we're trying to do and that's really interesting because it's, it's the sticky floors i didn't actually ever think about it from that concept because yeah you mentioned the glass ceilings but the sticky floors is things that we limit ourselves with and i remember i read a post mm-hmm. on linkedin and there's this guy um his name awesome career he's like a proper big LinkedIn guy and he makes all these amazing posts yeah. and he mentioned one when he was an intern like his manager said to him if you don't believe in yourself then why should anybody else and he's like oh, wow that's that's quite a sort of a mic drop moment where yeah. really got a deep that you know you need to like really look to build that confidence and put that belief in yourself and the best thing is it's possible. So if you're in a place where you just don't have that confidence, it can be built. You know, start doing things, start getting stuck in. Just, just starting by doing stuff, anything, is the way to go. Then then yeah. get, in, get involved in stuff that you may have not done before, get out of your comfort zone and knowing, practicing, learn, make the mistakes and just getting, starting that journey and, you know, getting more confident and in as a consequence, more confident, I think is the way to start going. And, and loads, I think every young Muslim has the potential to do it. There, there's no yeah. doubt about that there's like zero doubt there's so much potential and knowledge and know. yeah energy out there and it's just about channeling exactly. that and really the anchor has to be belief and confidence exactly exactly and i i would just say i remember being at uni and hearing this someone say this and i thought it was amazing that you as a muslim in this country you want to be making so you want to be shining light on your corner so much you want to be improving improving things so much that Everyone's going to be like, oh, well, if the Muslims ever left, they'll be like, oh, we can't, we can't do that because the Muslims aren't here. Like, it's, it's not as good because the Muslims aren't here. It's a very broad, like, quote, but it's this idea of, like, making positive contributions. Like, it, it doesn't just kind of, it's not just refined to your job role when you're in the office. It's about you bringing the cake in or something or, like, uh, organizing a lunch. Like, how can you make something better for people around you full stop? Um, and you want to do that as a Muslim and I, I agree with you there's so much untapped potential and I hate for the reason to be because we limit ourselves basically I think believe in yourself other people will follow and follow your energy follow your confidence and you can really just own a lot of it like, even if you make a mistake own that mistake because <laughs> you're yeah. going to make a lot 
um, and just own it and be like, I made a mistake, it was a human error, let's move on. <laughs> so you can just, you can assert yourself. Um, it doesn't mean that you have to be really loud, really extroverted. That's not what leadership is. Leadership is about uh, relationships just as much as, it, as it's about roles. And I think if you develop good relationships, if you know what your strengths are and lean on those, you will actually be making like a big contribution. And I think everyone can do that. 100%. And mistakes yeah. and setbacks are, you know, if you use it the right way, you can use it to learn and build on from and become better. So if, in any way, yeah. it can be a blessing in that sense. And it doesn't necessarily define you. What defines you is how you react and, you know, learn exactly. from it and become better. But I think on that very deep point of reflection, I think we should close it there and let Thank the you. listener deep that point and, and think about how can they... <laughs> build their confidence and are they holding themselves back Definitely. which is a big question you know if, if you listen to this are, are you somebody that's holding yourself back by not believing in yourself or by not having the confidence and what can you do yeah. to you know build it up um and if anybody does want to get in touch you know you can drop a comment ask some questions or you know Samiha is on LinkedIn and you can I'm sure she won't be she'll be happy to be contacted if you have any questions about Definitely. the social research stream or any, anything more specific about what was discussed in this podcast and maybe how you can get more prepared and more involved in this sort of um, career path but on that note you know Samia thank you for you know joining and thank you for really sharing your story and an amazing advice and insight into a profession that probably isn't ever spoken about in our community or ever considered like and, and, and it's been there for a long time so you know inshallah this will be a way to just to get it a bit more on the map and you know make our community aware of it and consider it as a, a real option to make change yeah definitely and no problem and yeah just to echo for anyone feel free to get in touch with me on linkedin i'm more than happy to be contacted and thank you as well for asking and for doing all that you do no problem no problem inshallah it'll be a success and inshallah people will benefit from it which is what we want and yeah this this is why we're bringing people in it's not just for the sake of it but for to really people to learn and benefit and know again that it can be done and really start building that definitely. belief and confidence but yeah on that note again thank you so much for um joining this and assalamu alaikum, well, alaikum.